Revelation chapter 2, let's begin reading together at verse 8, shall we? And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, the first and the last, who was dead and has come to life, says this, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich, and the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested, and you will have tribulation for 10 days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. Sometime around the end of the first century A.D., the Lord Jesus Christ was walking among the churches in what we now know as Asia Minor. After examining them and observing their activities, he decided to send a letter to seven of them. The aging elder John was in exile on the island of Patmos. In the book of the Revelation, he writes that he was caught up in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And while in the spirit, he was given visions of the Lord himself, visions of things that had already passed, and visions of things that were yet to come. The Lord Jesus instructed John in these visions to write these letters to the seven churches and get them in the mail as quickly as possible. Last week, we looked at the letter addressed to the church at Ephesus. That brings us today to examine the second of these seven letters, which also happens to be the shortest letter, the letter to the church at Smyrna. The city of Smyrna was located about 35 miles north of Ephesus. This was another grand city in that day with many natural as well as man-made wonders. The city of Smyrna had a magnificent library and various landmarks of stunning Greek architecture. There was a beautiful inland harbor in this city that was uniquely sheltered. This harbor was the central focus of the shipping and trade industry that was in Smyrna. The city of Smyrna was one of a very few planned cities in the world of that day. It had broad streets and avenues that were well laid out and meticulously paved. There was in the city a street called the Street of Gold on which were located numerous pagan temples to various Greek deities. Smyrna was also a city of advanced culture. Alexander the Great had determined to make Smyrna the model Greek city. Smyrna was the birthplace of Homer. It was a place where art, philosophy, music, and religion flourished. In addition to its greatness in trade and beauty and religious eminence, advanced culture, Smyrna was also a free city with a clear understanding of loyalty. Long before Rome was the undisputed ruler of the world, Smyrna had cast its lot with Rome, never to waver in its fidelity. In one of the battles Rome fought in the Far East, things were going badly with their army. When the soldiers of Rome were suffering from hunger and cold, the people of Smyrna stripped off their own clothes to send to that army. So loyal was Smyrna to Rome that when the cities of Asia Minor were competing for the privilege of erecting a temple to the godhead of Tiberias, Smyrna was picked out for that honor, overcoming even the great city of Ephesus. In Smyrna, her loyalty to Rome also made her one of the great centers of Caesar worship. Anyone who failed to recognize the Caesar as his or her supreme deity was viewed as an outlaw and subjected to horrible punishments and death. Now, in this city of Smyrna, a Christian church had been established, but it wasn't an easy road for these believers to travel. The church at Smyrna was a suffering church. The words we read at the beginning of the message today in the letter is the, is the letter the pastor of that suffering church received one day from the Lord Jesus. Now, the normal outline for the letters to these seven churches begins with an introductory statement followed by a commendation. That commendation is then followed by a rebuke, 
which leads to instruction and then to a warning and a promise. But in this letter to Smyrna, the pattern is broken. The church at Smyrna is suffering greatly, but there's not the first word of rebuke from the master. There isn't even a hint that there is anything they can do to change their current situation. The only word the Lord gives them is that they are suffering and it's going to get worse. Nevertheless, he wants to encourage them and he wants them to know that he is supporting them in the midst of their suffering. And I just believe the Lord would say the same thing to some of you who are listening to this message today. Maybe you're going through it. Maybe you're under the pile. Maybe you're experiencing trouble and pain. Maybe you're in a time of testing. If so, the Lord would say to you, hang on. Don't give up. I know what's happening. I haven't abandoned you. I'm supporting you even while you're going through this tough time. The message that comes through loud and clear from the letter to this church at Smyrna is that you can persevere through pain. You can triumph through trials. You can be victorious when you are victimized. You can receive support when you are suffering. And there are four things I want you to notice about this church at Smyrna that have special significance to where we find ourselves today. First, I want you to see the pressure they were under. Jesus says in verse 9, I know your tribulation. That word tribulation means literally to be crushed. It was used in classical Greek to describe the torture of being slowly mashed to death beneath the crush of an enormous boulder. Now, there's a wonderful play on words here when he uses this. One of the things the city of Smyrna was noted for was the spice myrrh. It's even in the name of the city, Smyrna. Well, in order to extract the fragrance of this spice... It had to be crushed. And the more the spice was crushed, the greater the fragrance that was released. Now watch what's, hap watch what's happening here. The Lord says, I know your tribulation. I know you've been under the load. I know the problems and the pressures have been weighing you down. I know you're being crushed beneath the weight of it all. But in the middle of all this crushing, the Lord would have you to know that your testimony can be the same as was the testimony of those early followers of Jesus in Smyrna. The more the trials weighed down upon them, the greater their witness shined. Every time the way grew dark, they kept praising. Every time the load got heavy, they kept being faithful. Every time it looked like they were going to be completely crushed, they lifted their voice one more time time in a song of victory. You see, the truth is trials are going to come. The only question is, what are you going to do when they come? How are you going to handle them? One person has said that trials will either make you bitter or they will make you better. And you have a choice. You can decide which one it's going to be in your life. What are you going to do with the trial when it comes? Let me tell you some things that are produced by trials when you decide that you're going to be better rather than bitter. First of all, trials can soften hard hearts. There's nothing like sudden tragedy or an intense pain or a terrible adversity to take a hard heart and melt it and break it and soften it up. Trials, if you allow them, can make you tender before the Lord once again. Second, trials will humble arrogant people. There is nothing like a terrible hardship to humble you and cause you to realize that you aren't as great as you think you are. You aren't as capable as you think you are. You really do need the help of the Lord if you're going to make it through. Third, trials will produce patience. You remember what James writes in chapter 1 of his epistle? Verses 2 through 4, he says, 
Consider it all joy, my brother. Don't you wish he hadn't put that in there? <laughs> you know, every now and then I read something in the Bible and I just say, man, I just wish that wasn't there. This is one of them. He says, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Trials produce patience. Fourth, trials produce purity. It's the meaning of Job 23, verses 8 through 10, when it says, Behold, I go forward, but he is not there, and backward, but I cannot perceive him. When he acts on the left, I cannot behold him. He turns on the right, I cannot see him. Watch this. But he knows the way I take. When he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. You know, the Bible talks about fiery trials with good reason. Those trials of life that come our way, they are refining fires. Sometimes we find ourselves in the middle of the furnace. And what do we say? Lord, would you just turn off the heat? And you know what happens? The heat gets turned up. And when it does, our first prayer is, God, get me out of this. But God's desire is more about our character than it is our comfort. So what does he do? He leaves us there. And the longer we stay in that fiery trial, the more of the dross, the impurities rise to the surface. We find out what really is on the inside of us. Then they are skimmed off by the Holy Spirit. And only when the impurities are gone, only then does he remove us from the fire. Understand this about the refining process. He will not leave you in the fire so long that you are permanently damaged. And when you come forth from that fire, you won't have the smell of smoke on you. And you will shine with a brightness and a luster that cannot be obtained any other way. I'm talking about the blessings of suffering. I'm talking about the fragrance that comes from being crushed. It can soften hearts, it can humble arrogant people, it can produce patience, it can produce purity. Those are the fragrances that are released when you are crushed, but you decide while you're going through the crushing that you're not giving up on God. You're not throwing in the towel, instead you're going to persevere under pressure. You're going to pass the test. That's when the fragrance is released. You know, when you look at the history of this church at Smyrna, you discover that as Caesar worship increased and the pressure to cave into that worship increased, the fragrance of those Christian believers just got sweeter. I suppose that everybody who studies early church history has heard of a man who was one of the early Christian martyrs, a man by the name of Polycarp. Anybody ever heard of Polycarp? Few of you have. What you may not know is that Polycarp was the pastor of the church at Smyrna when he was put to death because he would not renounce Jesus and proclaim that Caesar is Lord. When Polycarp was arrested and brought by mob before the proconsul, the proconsul gave him the choice of cursing the name of Christ and making sacrifice to Caesar or death. Here's what Polycarp said. Eighty and six years have I served him, and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who has saved me? The proconsul threatened him with burning at the stake, and Polycarp replied, You threaten me with the fire that burns for a time and is quickly quenched, for you do not know the fire which awaits the wicked in the judgment to come and in everlasting punishment. He said, Why are you waiting? Come do what you will. They they brought this old pastor to the stake where they had piled the wood high around it. But as they started to bind him to the stake, he said, leave me as I am, for he who gives me power to endure the fire will grant me to remain in the flames unmoved, even without the security you will give by the nails. And he was burned to death at the stake for his faith. You know, sometimes we think we have it so tough. 
we really don't know what suffering is all about. But why don't you ask Polycarp about suffering? The older I live, the less time I have for sniveling Christians who are so easily offended when somebody says something they don't like. Or somebody does something they don't like. Or somebody in leadership wants to go in a direction they don't want to go. They get all upset and they want to whine about how hard they have it. Nobody treats them right. Nobody really understands them. They're not going back to that church again. They're going to quit the ministry they've been starting. Grow up! Y'all better pray for your pastor, is he? There's the pressure of the church. Then I want you to see the poverty of the church. In verse 9, the Lord says to the church, I know your poverty. The word for poverty is one that describes complete destitution. Because of their stand for Jesus, these believers had lost everything. They had lost their jobs. Some of them had lost their families. Some of them had lost their inheritances. They had lost possessions. Thugs would come in the middle of the night, drag them out, beat them. Destroy all their property, all while the authorities would just look the other way. They were completely destitute. They were utterly poor, but Jesus says something strange about them here. He says, but you are rich. See, by every estimation of humanity, they were poor. But by every estimation of heaven, they were rich. They had lost it all on this earth, but they weren't cursing God. They were rejoicing. They were praising. They were giving thanks. They were persevering. They didn't know where their next meal was coming from, but they were holding on. Listen, Jesus uses a different measuring tool than the people of this world. Jesus has a different accounting system than this world. Jesus knows there are some people who have all the riches of this world, but they are miserable because for all their wealth, they are lonely and unhappy and fearful. And then there are people who seem to have none of this world's riches, but they are peaceful and contented and joyful and fulfilled and vibrant and delightful to be with. You need to learn that true riches can't be measured by the size of your bank account. True riches riches can't be measured by the size of your stock portfolio. True riches can't be measured by the amount of your real estate holdings. True riches can't be measured by the influence you have with other people. If you want to measure, see, see, you can't put a price on happiness. You can pay for prescriptions, but you can't buy health. You can go pay somebody to talk to, but you can't buy friendship. If you want to measure true riches, you'll find true riches measured in things like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and goodness, and faithfulness, and gentleness and self-control. You measure true riches in things like a peaceful home and a caring family and a loving spouse and respectful children. You measure true riches in things like integrity and loyalty and humility. That's the true wealth of this world. That's the kind of wealth money can never buy. I need to hurry on and show you the persecution of the church. Jesus says in verse 9 that he knows the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. That word blasphemy really means slander. There was a large group of Jews in the city of Smyrna, and they spent a great deal of time spreading false rumors about the followers of Jesus, stirring up trouble, slandering the people of God. Six slanders were regularly leveled against those early believers. One, on the basis of the words of the sacrament, this is my body and this is my blood, the story went about that the Christians were cannibals. Two, because the Christians called their common meal the agape, the love feast, it was said that their gatherings were orgies of lust. 
Three, because Christianity did indeed often split families when some members became followers of Jesus and some did not. The Christians were accused of tampering with family relationships. Four, the heathen accused the Christians of atheism because they couldn't understand a worship that had no images of the gods such as they themselves had. Five, the Christians were accused of being politically disloyal because they would not say Caesar is Lord. And six, the Christians were accused of being incendiaries because they foretold the end of the world in flames. Half-truths, untruths, false innuendo, outright lies, slander, blasphemy. That's the persecution this church was enduring. Some of you may know what that's like. Some of you know what it's like to serve the Lord only, only to have somebody start ugly rumors about you behind your back. Some of you know what it's like to be misunderstood when you try to do something positive. Some of you know what it's like for your motives to be brought into question. I can tell you if you're a leader, you're going to be slandered. It just goes with the territory. So, you know, understand that. I love the response of Nehemiah in the Old Testament when he has a group of people who are out to destroy the work he's doing for God and they're slandering him and they come to him and they start telling him all the rumors that are flying around. Remember, they try to get Nehemiah to come down off the wall in order to respond to the accusations. Here's what he says. He says, I'm doing a great work and I cannot come down. He says, why should the work of God languish while I leave it and come down to you? Now, here's what I've discovered. Your friends don't need your explanations. And your enemies wouldn't believe them even if you gave them. There are some things you don't even need to dignify with a response. You just shake it off and keep moving forward. Kind of reminds me of the story I heard about the, about the donkey that fell in the pit. He's down there braying, and the owner's people from the town came and saw this donkey down in the pit. It's such a deep pit, they can't hoist him out and everything. So they said, well, we just as well to bury him and be done with it. They start shoveling dirt on him, shoveling dirt. Dirt's falling on his back. Donkey's braying. After a while, the dirt gets heavy. He just does like this and shakes it off. Steps up on that sh little pile that he shook off, and they keep shoveling. He shakes it off and keeps stepping. After a while, he walks out of the pit. Some of you just need to shake it off and step up a little higher. Shake it off and step up and keep moving forward for God. Did you, did you see what Jesus said in verse 10? He said, do not fear what you are about to suffer. Shake it off and step up. See, when I read the words of Jesus to this church at Smyrna, the first thing I am struck with in all this talk of pressure and poverty and persecution, what really excites me is when I read the Lord Jesus says, I know. Now, there are two ways I can think of to know something. You can know something because you, because you read it in a book or because somebody told you about it. That's one way to know. The other way you can know something is because you have experienced it. And that's the meaning of the word Jesus uses here. It's not an intellectual exercise, it's experiential. He says, I know all about it. He says, I understand because I've been right where you are. I've endured suffering, I've endured adversity, I've been stripped of everything I had, I've been falsely accused and persecuted and lied about, I know all about it. And because of this kind of knowledge, then I want you to see the fourth thing, I want you to see the prize of the church. Verse 10, Jesus says, do not fear what you are about to suffer. And at the end of the verse, he says, be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. 
You know what he's saying? He's saying, hold on. See, in Smyrna, they had, they had great athletic contests. They had men who would train for months. They would deny themselves creature comforts. They would put themselves through all kinds of physical punishment in order to get their bodies in condition for peak performance. And then on the day of the contest, they would race flat out in order to win the prize. Do you know what that prize was? <laughs> it was a garland of vines woven together and worn around their head. That was it. Jesus says, hold on, endure what's going on, and if you'll hold on, I'll give you a crown. But the crown I give, it won't be this garland of leaves that's going to wilt and fade. No, the crown I give is a crown of life. Jesus says, do not fear. The word of the Lord is always, fear not. When Jesus says, Fear not, you can take him at his word because he's already been this way. He understands what suffering and ridicule and pain and hardship and adversity is all about. If my Lord and Savior says there's nothing to fear, I'm just going to trust him. See, if there were something to worry about, he would tell me. But since he tells me not to fear, then he must have everything under control. So I'm not going to worry about it. And that's the place the Lord is always trying to bring you to, the place of total trust in Him. I know you're under pressure. I know you're stressed. I know people are saying things about you that aren't true. I know, that, you know, we live in this culture where they're trying to get the church to agree with the craziness that the world is promoting. <laughs> you know, the world can't even figure out what a woman is. <laughs> I'm, and these are supposed to be smart people. It's not that complicated. They've tried to make it complex. And they go through all kind of verbal and mental gymnastics. But a woman, when I look to the definition, it's just simply an adult human female. I know you were looking for something way more... I don't even know how I got strung out on this, except, <laughs> except that this is part of what's being pressed upon us, and somehow, because we refuse to cave to this kind of insanity, we are being told that we are bigoted, we are out of touch, we are Neanderthals, and you know, whatever else they can come up with. I want to tell you, at some point, somebody just needs to stand up and say, no, here's the truth of the matter. I know people are doing, I know the world is doing that, and trying to do that to the church. But when are we just going to release all the worry and trust him? Amen. When will you just release your disappointment and trust him? When are you going to release your hurt and trust him? The lesson from the letter to the church at Smyrna is this. Hold on and trust him. Hold on and trust him. Let me give you six reasons real quick to hold on. Number one, hold on because he is eternal. In verse 1, Jesus identifies himself as the first and the last. He knows the end from the beginning. Colossians says he is before all things, and by him all things exist. Moses sang in Psalm 90, verse 2, Before the mountains were born, or you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. 
He is Alpha and Omega. He is beginning and ending. He is first and last. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Everything he used to be, he still is. He will be forevermore. Hold on. He is eternal. Reason number two. Hold on. He is victorious. He says he is the first and the last who was dead and has come to life. Don't miss that. When the Bible says he was dead, the tense of that verb means became. Jesus became dead. It was an episode through which he passed. When the Bible says has come to life or is alive, the tense of that verb means came to life again. The reference is to the event of the resurrection. So here it is. The risen Christ who has passed through death came to life again in the triumphant event of the resurrection and now is alive forevermore. Jesus Christ is the one who has experienced the worst that life could do to him. But Jesus, as the risen Lord, is the one who has conquered the worst that life can do. See, Satan thought he had his number. Death thought he had him locked up tight. The grave thought he had him forever sealed. But early on the morning of the first day of the week, they discovered what he had known all along. Long. The borrowed tomb couldn't hold him. The seal on the stone in front of the tomb couldn't hold him. The guard stationed outside the tomb couldn't hold him. The grave clothes wrapped around his body couldn't hold him. Resurrection power coursed through his body. Hell's gates trembled. The grave burst open. He snatched away the keys from the devil. He walked out of the tomb in resurrection power as the sun shining in his strength. He led captivity captive, gave gifts unto men. He Prove once and for all that all power in heaven and earth is in his hand. He is victorious. Praise be to God. See, 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 most men live and then die. Jesus died and now lives. Hallelujah. <laughs> You can hold on and have victory because he is eternal, because he is victorious. Reason number three, hold on, he is all-knowing. Jesus says, I know. I know everything you're going through right now. I know the pain you feel. I know the heartache you bear. I know you've been betrayed. I know they're jealous about the way you sing. I know they're jealous about the way you teach. I know they're jealous about the way you look. I know how they talk about you in the office. I know what they're saying about you on the job. I'm not ignorant about what's going on here. I'm no, I know what's going on. You don't have to explain it to me. And that brings me to reason number four. You can hold on and you can have victory because he is sovereign. In verse 10, Jesus tells this church, you will have tribulation 10 days. This verse tells me the Lord Jesus Christ is sovereign. It tells me Jesus is in control. It tells me there is a limit to the testing and there is a limit to the suffering. The time limit is determined by none other than the Savior. (laughs) See, See, the critics may be having a field day right now, but they can only do so much. The devil can only go so far. The Lord has determined just how long this thing is going to last. He is in control. And this struggle you're in is not going to last one moment longer than he allows. You're in his hands, so just trust him with that. How long, Lord, will when I say it's enough? Okay, until then, what do I do? Just hang on and trust me. I'm sovereign. I've got this thing under control. You can hold on and have victory because he's eternal. He's victorious. He's all-knowing. He's sovereign. Reason number five, you can hold on because he is purposeful. Verse 10, Jesus says, Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison. Watch this. That you may be tested. How many of you know there is a spiritual enemy who comes to steal, kill, and destroy? He has determined ill for you and not good. But I want you to know, don't miss this, please. Whatever Satan proposes, God has to permit. That's the lesson of Job. God sets the boundaries. 
Whatever Satan proposes, God has to permit. And God only permits that which serves his purpose. So if you're going through it right now, God has a reason. Oh, you may not understand what's going on. You may have all kinds of questions, but if you'll allow the crushing to produce the fragrance of Christ in your life, God will bring the time of testing to an end. And when the trial is over, you'll come forth as pure gold. And hold on and be victorious because he's eternal, he is victorious, he is all-knowing, he is sovereign, he is purposeful. Reason number six, he is generous. He says here in verse 10, be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. In verse 11, he says, he who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. I'm telling you today, there's a crown for those who will not give up. There's a crown for those who will persevere. There's a crown for those who will endure to the end. You're not running in vain. And, and, and let me remind you, this isn't a sprint. It's a marathon. It's too soon to quit. You haven't yet reached the finish line. You keep running this race. You keep being faithful. You keep praying. You keep believing. You keep witnessing. You keep serving. Because soon and very soon, you're going to receive a crown. It's a victor's crown. It's an overcomer's crown. It's a crown of life. The one who is the giver of life. The one who died and came back to life. The one who has made it possible for the second death not to harm you. He is the one who has promised to give you a crown of life. That's your reward, child of God. That's your reward. Hallelujah. Preach long enough. I've overpreached my time. So let me close the message. I want to give you three conclusions. Three statements in conclusion. One, the Lord knows all about your circumstances. Two, if things stay the same, there's no reason to fear and there's no reason to run. And three, if things get worse, which they probably will, he will see you through. Stand with me, please. I hope you're encouraged today. I hope you're encouraged to just keep going. Go one more day. Take, take, take another step. Just keep moving forward. Father, I'm praying for this congregation now. I'm praying that you will build into them a stick to itiveness and ability to persevere. Build into them a, a, a solid confidence that they are yours and you are theirs. Don't let us forget that, Lord, and give us that, that assurance that lets us know we can trust you no matter what's happening. Build that into our lives today, I pray. Let your word strengthen us today. Encourage us, challenge us, transform us from, from wimpy, weak to stalwart, strong. And then honor the perseverance of your saints, I pray. Thank you for doing that today, Lord. Thank you for our time in your presence. Thank you for meeting with us. We offer this whole day to you. Amen. Amen. Amen.